Hello and welcome everybody. I'm John Fain, welcoming you to the Monash University Law School marvellous moot court. It's a bit eerie for me to be back here. It's as close to the bench as I'm ever going to get, but it's a, it's a fabulous facility and it's wonderful to be able to be here for the fourth in our series for 2021 of In Conversation with people who have made a contribution to the law, many of them Monash Law alumni. I'll introduce you to Jen Coate in just a moment, a contemporary of mine and a friend and someone whose legal career has just ticked so many, so many boxes along the way. Before we go too far, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and also express my impatience personally for a treaty or treaties in order to address some of the mistakes we've made in the past. Monash Law have put on this series for 2021 and we've had three fabulous guests, Sean McAuliffe, Alan Finkel and Carol Schwartz, and they're all archived if you want to go and have a look at them. And today we have the benefit of trying to keep up with the career, the extraordinary achievements of Her Honour, the Honourable Justice, I've never called her this, Jennifer Coate. As I said, she was a friend of mine when we were both students in this very building in what seems like a lifetime ago. I'll dispense with the formalities, if I may, because, Jen, it would seem absolutely ridiculous to address you as Your Honour. Do I have your permission? You definitely do, John. Good, because if I didn't, I think we wouldn't be getting terribly far. <laughs> <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground together, but I think what's really important in trying to get across to the alumni, the students, the both present and future students, is what law school taught you that stayed with you through private practice, the children's court where you ended up as president, the coroner's court where you were chief coroner. And there's a pattern here. Wherever you go, you end up being the boss in charge because of your many redeeming features, which we'll learn about. And then the Royal Commission into Institutional Abuse and the Hotel Quarantine Inquiry that's really only just starting to, to settle down now. So what is it about law school that prepared you for those roles? So, I mean, one of the most important things I think that law school does is it uh, teaches you how to discover the law. Um, and that's obviously an extraordinarily important part of the toolkit that one needs to take into the future. You also learn that you can't possibly know everything about the law um, and that I think is one of the anxieties that first strikes young people and or um, even the mature age people that come into the law um, as I was. So once you actually understand that what you're doing is learning how to learn the law and how to find the law, um, that is uh, what will um, set up anyone for the movement actually into the practice of the law. So learning how to learn. Learning how to learn, learning where to find the law. Being open to learning is critical. You touched on what I think is one of the key ingredients to your success, if I can be so presumptuous, but, you know, having known each other for a very long time, I'm sure there's things about me I don't want you telling people to. But you didn't come to the law straight out of school. No. And I think that's a really important part of your success. So take everybody through how you ended up being a Monash Law student and graduate. So I suppose one of the one of the important things that I think shaped me um, in my travels and travails through the law was where I grew up um, and what shaped me during my childhood and formative years, and then I'll come back to um, before I actually got to Monash. So I actually grew up down the road from here. I grew up in Dandenong North in the 1950s when um, the then Housing Commission um, built an enormous number of places to create the workers for International Harvester, GMH, Heinz, and all of those big factories that were being built. So um, my family moved into one of those places, so I one of those homes. So I grew up on that estate and went to school, primary school and high school 
Had yeah. anyone in your family ever been to university before? No. Both of my parents left school um, before school leaving age for different reasons. <clears throat> my father, um, because his mother was widowed and had to support three children, so he had to go and get a job. And my mother, um, my mother grew up actually in foster care. She was um, relinquished as a baby and grew up in a foster care placement and was relinquished again at age 14. So we could so, have a sharper yeah. contrast with the public perception so often bandied around that a whole lot of, you know, privileged private school kids end up kind of getting a, uh, a conveyor belt through law school and into the profession. Your story is the precise flip side to that. It, it, it definitely is. It's, it's what's um, generally, generally referred to as a non-traditional path into the law. <laughs> In um, fact, I think it's much more common than people acknowledge because usually people right. don't talk about it. You're right, John. They don't. Um, if you didn't go to one of, the, um, one of the prestigious schools, you usually don't talk about it, hmm. um, which is a shame because that silences people who need to be proud of where they came from. Um, and indeed I am, and I, um, I have huge admiration for both of my parents who struggled against enormous adversity to produce um, a loving, stable, protective family that um, gave me the um, protective coating that I needed uh, to do the work that I do, as well as the um, inspiration. You were a teacher for how many years? I was a teacher for um, four years full time in uh, in primary school, um, and then for I taught for three years part time whilst I was here at Monash completing um, my law degree. Because so you were, you were a part time years. student at first, and then you went full time to finish. Oh, I think. that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I I got a um, teaching studentship to study to become a teacher. Uh, and I did that because that was my ticket to a tertiary education. Um, and, and I had no was, other way of getting there. Was that the nuns that encouraged you to go down that path? Uh, no, I was I was in a state, in school, a state school, in a state school, Lindale Primary School and Lindale High School. A shout out to them. <laughs> um, the only other um, person who uh, the school, well, I shouldn't say the only other person, the person that the school lords the most um, is Johnny Farnham. Oh, now, now you've got real cred. I can't, I can't compete, <laughs> I'm afraid. Are you going to get up and do Sadie the cleaning lady for us? Or? Yeah. Were you there at the same time? Yes, yes, I was. Yeah, uh, I was there at the same time. And I, I remember the, um, um, the scathing way in which we all responded to him when he agreed to sing at the school fete. <laughs> <laughs> I should quickly forever, mention, forever in shame we are for that. We have some distinguished scholars here at the moot court with us. And if you've got questions, we'll incorporate them and build them in to our conversation here. And of course, you can also ask questions on the technology by using the, uh, the Q&A function uh, that's at the bottom of your screen. And I'll try and work those in. And I also should have mentioned at the start, but I'll belatedly mention it now, that if you want to share this broadcast, then tell other people and friends if they might be interested in joining in. We've got uh, who knows how many people and people from all around the world who have been joining in on this series of In Conversations. So going from being a teacher for a few years, what made you flick the switch from teaching to law? Well, in fact, I, I always wanted to do law, um, but uh, the path uh, I, there was a huge boulder thrown in my path. Well, a few boulders thrown in my path. Um, one of them was uh, a, I grew up at a time when there was no such thing as careers teachers. Um, but my English teacher uh, on one particular occasion asked us in the course of a general conversation what we would like to do when we left school. And um, I, I was actually, too embarrassed to say in front of the class that I wanted to be a lawyer um, because it was just not, it was unheard of in my school. And um, women who wanted careers were either nurses or teachers. And so I quietly went to my teacher afterwards and indicated to her 
um, I had a lot of trust in her and a lot of admiration for her and I indicated my um, secret mm. desire. And to her absolute credit, um, she, and she asked me if I knew any lawyers and I said I didn't, never met one. And I was probably about 15 or 16 at that time. And she asked me if I would like to meet one. I said yes. And so she arranged for me to have a meeting with a Dandenong solicitor who shall remain nameless. And uh, I went into his office and he sat me down and asked me um, uh, in no particular order that I can remember, but I certainly remember the questions. Um, do you know anyone in the law? No. Do your parents have any money? No. Um, and the next, the next was, um, look, dear, you, you don't have any <clears throat> connection to the law. <clears throat> Excuse me, your parents don't have any money and you're a woman. And women don't fare very well in the law. And you seem like a, you know, a, a, a smart, intelligent young person. Why don't you go into teaching? And um, I was crushed, really crushed when I came out of that um, engagement with the first lawyer that I'd ever met. Um, and one of the things I have dedicated myself to in, those, in all of the years since was to encourage every person um, who wants to go into the law to not encounter those boulders that I did. You and I were here at an extraordinary time in the history of this university and this law school. Our contemporaries were Peter Costello, the Kroger brothers, Michael and Andrew, uh, John Thwaites, who became deputy premier in the Brax and then Brumby governments. I could rattle off a list of a whole lot more. Mark Birrell, who was a minister yeah. in the government. There were a whole bunch of them. Extraordinary people who went on to do extraordinary things. How did you find the law school when you came here? And that was the the mood. It was also a time, I should say, of course, post Whitlam mm. dismissal of great upheaval and protest. Mm. Mm. So bearing in mind that I got out of step with my peers in the sense that I had gone to teachers college um, before um, before getting here. So I, I went, I studied for three years to get my um, teaching diploma and then had my studentship extended at exactly the time um, that we no longer had to pay fees. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the other boulders, apart from that engagement with the lawyer. So um, I didn't have to pay the fees. I had that teaching studentship, which had helped me get books and buy uniforms in high school and get, and get through um, teachers college. Um, and so I, um, I had come, I came into the law school having um, a whole other experience of the world. I hadn't come straight from school. And so again, it was part of that um, non-traditional um, life that, uh, that brought me into the law school. Um, I, I, was, uh, I was hugely, um, hugely excited about being here. I didn't take one day for granted of the great good fortune I had to arrive here. So one of my experiences coming back to your question was to engage with lots of young people who I thought did take it for granted um, that they were here and that they had the great privilege of um, being able to get a tertiary education and to um, stare into the future of joining um, what I, I still think to this day is a wonderful profession. You were much more diligent than I was, I should quickly say and reassure people if there's any doubt about it, that you were a, an excellent student. And then you went into private practice. Tell us mm. about your first venture out of the law school and into uh, a private practice where you, you know, like when you learn to drive, you know, you only just get your licence. It's you when do. you're out there that you start yeah, to really you learn. do, you do. Um, so one of my experiences that um, about facing that prospect of moving out of the law school and into private practice, which um, might resonate with some of the students here, is that huge anxiety that one starts to feel about 
will I will I find a job? Will I will I get employed? Will I um, will I like it? Um, is it what I think it's going to be? Um, will I, I be any good at it? And will I be any good at it? Um, have I made the right decisions? Yeah. Because I, of course, um, gave up one career to come in to come into the law school. Um, but like Johnny Farnham, he could always go back if he needed to. I think he was a sparky, wasn't he? You could always have gone back. Yeah, I th he was. He was in one of the trades. I think yeah. you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I, of course. But um, look, I was pretty sure. Um, I was pretty sure that that um, passion in me that had been put in there, I, I, I think, by a whole range of um, influences during my childhood and those years that you speak about, that we grew up in, the years of um, the civil rights movement in the US, you know, Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, Pete Seeger, <laughs> Country Joe and the Fish. I mean, they were they were years that, um, that shaped me and my thinking and my sense that um, the, the framework and the structures that we live in are incredibly important to understand. Sure, but so much has changed. I mean, in our direct coterie, uh, Sue McGregor was told in court one day she was wearing trousers and the judge said, I won't hear you. Yes. Um, people were confronting some of these barriers on a regular basis, almost every day. There, were, there was one law firm that I know of that had all women partners yes. only. Yes. It was the only one in existence. Yeah. So how did you go in? I mean, you didn't just smash ceilings. You just ignored them from what I could see. Yeah, I, th I think, look, yeah. understanding where we came from as women coming into the law was really important for me. It was really important for me to uh, conf understand, be aware and confront um, yet another reason to feel like an outsider, a non a non traditional person in the law. So yes, we were told um, you have to dress in a certain way. Um, you have, to, and and th that certain way was um, a, a sort of mystery, I think, to some of the senior men on the bench, because, of course, as women arrived into the profession, uh, and and indeed. Um, onto the benches, um, it was confronting and disturbing, I think, for some men. You have to dress in a particular way. You have to speak and present yourself in a particular way. Women are going to have trouble because um, they don't have voices that pro project very well. So one of the things that I did um, is I, I found my people. And so, it, so what I mean by that is I joined a group of like-minded people called feminist lawyers, the genesis of which was on this campus, by the way. Yep. Bibi Loff. Bibi and Loff and Julia Pullen and yep. a bunch of other. Meredith, yeah, yep. Meredith Carter, that's right. And Amanda George. Amanda George. Yep. And, um, and uh, listened and um, uh, participated in um, paving a way, not just for us, but for all of the women coming after us, that, that felt really important. But to have that group and that sense of belonging um, shifted, shifted me out of, out of a sense that uh, I was in there trying to um, forge new paths um, on my own. And there were some fantastic and remain some fantastic women who continued to do uh, outstanding work in that regard. Did you ever suffer from imposter syndrome, as it's called? Where every, people feel I didn't, I don't belong here. Uh, about every second day, I would say. So, how do you overcome it? Um, again, it's. I, I found the the best remedy, treatment, um, for it was to acknowledge it, and invite others to acknowledge it too. And it, it really is, um, again, a very protective coating when you understand this is just not something that you are locked in, into thinking, um, that it's, 
amongst so many other, and I'm sure it's not just women, I'm sure, mm. I'm sure there are men who have exactly the same anxieties as well. And talking about it, um, acknowledging it, and then talking about the strategies that one can use to assist in, in overcoming it are really important and helpful and uplifting. There's some, we're going to have to skip along, um, which means that on the broadcast and here in the room, you're not going to hear about the strawberry daiquiri incident. Um, where, well, let's just say you're not going to hear about it. It's probably just as well for both of us. But It changes every time we talk about it, I might add. Yeah, but, but if yeah. there's ever an unplugged version of these in conversations, mm -hmm. not that it's X-rated, not for a moment, it's just... Um, it's hilariously funny, but it showed me, just take it from me, it's one of those things. Uh, it, it taught me the strawberry daiquiri incident where, in a nutshell, Jen and I had to go at midnight to try and get a kid bail in Frankston, and I got thrown out of Frankston Police Station. For misbehaving. Yeah. It's hard to believe, I know, <laughs> but there we are. But Jen succeeded in charming a, a sergeant and a bail justice when all I did was give them the shits, quite frankly, but there we go. It taught me that there was no length you weren't prepared to go to on behalf of your client. Was that because of your background? Uh, I think it I think it played an enormous part, uh, John, in terms of what what shaped me and what gave me that passion. I, um, as you've heard, grew up in that uh, on a housing commission estate. so, just in my street, not to mention the streets around me and at my school, I saw um, poverty, disadvantage, violence, crime, alcoholism. Uh, and these people, they came out of the same street as me. They were at my school. I, I knew them. Um, lots of them were uh, the, 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 the kids and indeed the parents that I knew, they were good people um, who had had terrible paths and been exposed to great trauma and disadvantage if one took the time to sit down and learn their stories. So that empathy that's deeply ingrained in you, has it made you a better decision maker and judge? Well, that's probably for someone else to judge. Rather okay, I'll than say it's made you a better decision maker and okay. a better judge. Yeah. I'm, I'm grateful for those experiences. What, what I add into that is um, what, was, what I learned in my own home and what was impressed upon me, in particular by my mother, firstly, the importance of education. Um, she impressed that upon me every day. But the importance of one's social responsibilities. So despite what you've heard about my background, I actually grew up thinking that we were a very privileged and fortunate family until I got out of Dandenong North and looked around and realised um, I, was, I was somewhat mistaken. But that, um, that, that was ingrained in me and I understood it to mean I grew up in a house um, where both of my parents were present where I was loved unconditionally. I was told that every day. Um, my parents were proud of me. They told me that um, I wasn't subjected to, um, to violence and so on and so on. So, and, you know, I could go away. This was one of the markers in my school that when the school excursions were called on, who could go? Mm. And it was usually about money. Yeah. So, for example, I got to go on a trip to Canberra when I was about 13 or 14 years old with the school and I was part of a handful of kids who could go because most of the others, the amount of money that had to be paid was just out of reach for the families. So, yes, all of those it's things. All part are, of it. It's all part of it, yeah. So Lots of questions coming in and I'm going to weave them through and someone who doesn't want their name put on here is saying, well, how is all that compassion and that empathy factored into teaching the next generation of law students? If they don't have the background you've had, how can you, in a way, put it on or put it in to 
learning the black letter law that's mm. an essential part of getting through. Yeah. So the black letter law is obviously fundamental. Yep. There's no uh, there's no substitute for that, and there's no substitute for hard work, yep. self discipline, yep. um, self reliance. Yep. You're no use unless you're competent. Yeah, yep. that, that, that's right. But <coughs> my answer to my answer to that question is: um, look around you. Because you can't make people be empathetic. You can't. No, you absolutely can't. Look around you and and listen, and um, as uh, as I've heard um, people say so often, listen to hear. Um, and and if you listen openly to um, people who are coming in to seek help and assistance from you, um, you you will understand. Uh, and, and develop an understanding of uh, where where people's difficulties and challenges in life have taken them. So, um, it, it, to me, when I when I hear people talk about you know if you if you work hard and have a dream, um, you'll get to where you want to go. Um, I I always put a rider on that. Um, because uh, th there, there are a lot of people who work hard and have a dream. Well, Coach Hin exactly asks that question. Yeah. You know, I mean, getting a foot in the door when you don't have connections is the hardest thing. It's very hard. Could the legal profession do better at opening opportunities for people who don't have familial or other connections? The old school tie or someone's dad's golfing friend? Uh, I, I, for sure, they, for sure, the, the, the profession could do better, our law schools could do better about ensuring that um, people who are, uh, who are capable and enthusiastic about coming into the law but have all of those yep. boulders or barriers that we've spoken about um, can't get past them. And, uh, and we, you know, it's a competitive profession. The, really? one, the one that we go into. Whoever would have known. Oh, you might not have noticed that, no, John. No, no, no. Um, it's a very competitive profession and it's, I think, one of the, um, it, it is one of the reasons we don't talk about the emotional and psychological impacts and stressors on us when we, when we get out into the profession, indeed when we're still in law school. It's one of the great dirty secrets of the law, in fact, mm. I've always thought you know, um, we don't talk about the people who fall by the wayside and there's a notorious casualty rate. It's extraordinary. And yet no one asks, no one really interrogates no. the, the dysfunction in a system that leads to that. But I want to jump to the, the, the Black Saturday bushfires. Mm -hmm. You and I, we actually exchanged some fairly terse communications we did. over this because we we're on opposite sides in a way. You were the coroner. I wasn't on anyone's side, but... No, anyway. but we were on opposite sides of an argument. Mm. Um, I don't know if we actually came to blows or anything, but we certainly... I, I was trying to help people who thought you were in their way. Mm. Take us back to the stresses of Black Saturday mm. and um, you were ready... This is always forgotten, but really important to remind you already had your hands full at the coroner's court even before mm. that day. So take us back to what happened even before Black Saturday and then the immediate aftermath. Um, so you, you're right. Um, uh, some of you might recall that there was, um, in the weeks leading up to Black Saturday, a number of uh, very, very hot days. Absolute heat wave. Heat waves. Um, so two and three days in a row over 40. And tragically, uh, that caused an enormous number of casualties that uh, uh, fatalities um, that uh, resulted in those deaths being reported to the coroner because they fitted within the definition of reportable deaths yep so we had uh, a lot of a lot of extra work on our hands that um, had come in suddenly and unexpectedly which is the nature one of the areas of reportable death so um, in that lead up to, uh, to Black Saturday, um, uh, I, I, I'll take a step back. 
um, the way in which it worked at the court was that there was always a coroner on duty. There had to be because hours a day, seven it's, days a, a, week. it's yep. a seven day a week, 24 hour day um, jurisdiction that has to be available. So I was not the coroner on duty on, on Black Saturday. Um, that was my colleague, the deputy coroner, uh, Ian West, if, I, if memory serves me correctly. So I was at home experiencing um, the, the absolute e e extraordinary nature of that day until I got a call uh, from what we used to call the back office. So that was the 24 hour office. <clears throat> and the first call was, um, have you been watching the news? And I, I said that um, I hadn't. Uh, no, you'd been, been listening to the radio, surely. <laughs> um, uh, and Isn't that what everybody does? Yeah. Of <laughs> and uh, so what I got told was that the um, police were reporting to us that they believed up to... Uh, up to 25 people may have perished so in, that was in what, the fires. What, what sort that of was, time? That was probably uh, by about 9 o'clock on the Saturday evening of, of the 7th of February. So I said, OK, I'll just get changed and come in. Um, clearly, everyone needed a lot of um, guidance and, uh, I suppose, calm and leadership and and there I are protocols like to be followed in the event of a mass death there are protocols they what's called the disaster victim identification protocols that are actually protocols that have been um, developed by the international police association so interpol yep. for for um, mass fatality identifications so i was familiar with that and there was a manual there so <clears throat> Um, I, I spent a number of hours then going through, thinking through what we what we needed to do. By the time I left um, to come back home and get a little bit of sleep, because I knew we had to get up early and get out into the um, fire areas, <clears throat> um, I had spoken with a senior member of police who said, "Look, I know we're saying the 25 casualties um, uh, fatalities." I'm afraid it might be as high as 40. So, And for people who don't remember, the eventual number on the actual day itself, to say nothing of what happened afterwards, was 173? 173, yeah, it was the actual number. And that's just on that day. And I'm always very quick to say, and many people died afterwards, many at their own hand, from the trauma of the event. Of and it exposed. grieves their families even worse when they're not included. And if the figure of 173 is the only one ever referred to, then all those people feel forgotten. So it's always, in my mm. mind, 173 plus the people who mm. died afterwards. But going back, you then had to kick in a team and a response, the likes of which this community, and in fact, Australia has never seen before. That's so. So how do you know what to do? <clears throat> well, uh, as I said, I, I was familiar, I had familiarised myself with the disaster victim identification process and I understood that we had to, uh, I had to go um, with the team of experts, so um, police and technical experts and forensic investigators, out to make an assessment. And this was, this was part of um, where we were in completely unknown territory um, because the uh, manual we had to make an assessment of the scene. Now, as you might remember, there were many scenes. Certainly there was do. not one scene. And so the manual had been developed on the basis that there would be like a plane crash, a twin, a plane crash the Twin Towers yep. bombing, the, you know, um, and, it, and the Bali bombing. Um, so we, we chose to go to two sites, um, both of which, so both of which, were actually still uh, on fire. There was still fire um, burning. There were telegraph poles Which hanging two were there. They? Um, uh, we were in Whittlesea and King Lake, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it was a scene, I, I, know, I know you've heard many people um, describe what, what that was like to be there. Um, and of course, I was looking with a very particular um, 
uh, response and through a very particular lens. But um, I remember coming back to uh, coming back to the Coronial Services Centre after we'd been up there, and saying to people, "To me, it looked like a malevolent giant had." walked through that place and picked up, I don't know if you're familiar with those huge mountain ash trees, those massive eucalypts, had just picked them up and pulled them out of the ground. That trees had exploded out of the ground and the trees that were standing, such was the force and intensity of the wind that the leaves were frozen in, in the direction that the wind was, was blowing and there was a stillness because there were no animals, there was no bird sound. Um, so the, the, the impact of the scene, not to mention um, the carnage that was there, was very confronting. How do so, you put all that aside and concentrate on the... On our job. The task, yes. The, 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 so the task at hand was um, as, as quickly as we could do it, and as efficiently um, without making a mistake was to then launch into endeavouring to identify um, all, of, all of those people who, who perished in the fires. Now, the protocols that I remember, I'll, I'll shortcut it if I can, mm. um, you're not allowed to release any remains until you've identified all the remains. And that caused secondary trauma to the families who are grieving because they wanted to bury their loved ones. I remember Carol Matthews, mm. who became the lead plaintiff in the class action yes. and who got on to us at the ABC very mm. early on saying, they won't give me my son's body. Mm. He died in the bathroom of our house mm. on the phone talking to me as he died. I know it's him and they won't give us his body and mm. she was furious she, she wanted was, your guts for garters she was terribly distressed yeah and yet you you couldn't do anything about it as i understand it well we eventually um, discovered well well um what uh, what did happen um and i don't particularly want to talk about individuals but um you've you've raised a particular matter. Well, she so, was very so public at the she time. She was very public, so I'm... I, I'm sure I, I have agree her permission, and we, we did a lot of things together over many years. Yes, months. and I've um, since met her also. Uh, but her, my, my recollection of her particular issue, John, was the one that you've just articulated, which was that the disaster victim identification process that um, the police and the forensic experts were were talking about and had worked with many times um, required scientific evidence yeah. um, to conduct an identification and that circumstantial evidence such as you've just outlined was um, was not acceptable in that process so um, what we did uh, and um, Ms. Matthews, of course, was not the only one who was um, who was terribly affected uh, by well by everything that happened, including the tragic loss of her son. Um, we we adapted our own process, our identification process, um, to that multi fatality scene. So when we set up what we called our identification boards, we in fact. Um, did take circumstantial evidence. So we, we my, got my, statements. My recollection is it took some time. It took five weeks. Yeah, for, that, took five for that shift, weeks during which time every day she was going, I want to bury my son, I want to bury my son, I want to bury my son. Yeah. So what to cut to the chase on what it means for the law, mm. to get to the point where you realise if we just stick to the normal practices and procedures here, we're actually causing more harm. Yep than has already happened, we yeah. have to change. Yeah. How hard is it to persuade others, because you're not acting on your own, mm. you're working in a system, that mm. this is the only way we can proceed? So just, just to, finish, um, to finish on that part of the story, which was, um, which was about um, the release of human remains, and I, I don't want to get into the detail of it because it's, it's very confronting yeah. um, for people to listen to, um, and especially if one's um, not prepared to understand it. But 
um, as I think the um, scientific experts were explaining um, during that period, um, people, the, the, the temperatures that were existing inside, that, that inside buildings at that time were the same temperatures that were inside, that, that are used in crematoriums. Mm -hmm. And so that helps people understand some of the difficulty in identification. Yep. Um, there are questions coming in, mm. which I'm going to defer about the emotional impact on you. Yes. Because you went through a parallel um, procedure of juggling your professional obligations and your emotions when you were one of the Royal Commissioners on the Royal Commission into Institutional Abuse. Yeah. And there's been so much said about this. I don't want to cover that same ground although it's absolutely extraordinary stuff. But I want to talk about the, the effect of you dealing with your work and your emotions in bushfires and then adding on after what would have been a full dose for just about anybody, you then took on one of the most harrowing and gruelling personal tasks. And I know how much, at what personal cost, and I know you don't want to talk about it, I'm just going to acknowledge it. But how do you then add on a responsibility like that when you've already had a lifetime's quota mm. of emotional distress in your work as the coroner? So the first thing to say about that is um, nothing, um, nothing that I had learnt um, in law school or indeed um, throughout my time in the profession um, prepared me for that emotional, for that emotional and psychological impact. And that's not a criticism of the law school. It's not a criticism at all. Could you no. ever teach, with what you now know, mm. could you teach any of that stuff? Um, yes, yes. And I think it's important to do that. You see, uh, one of the things I came to realise, and I, I came to realise this probably most significantly during the Royal Commission, is that we understandably, we get trained that to engage in the law is an intellectual exercise. We get trained to and, and disciplined to understand that. Um, remember all of that teaching we had about the subjective test and the objective test, and we get taught about the importance of rational thinking and objectivity. Professional distance, not getting emotionally involved. That's right. Sounds great in theory. And 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 we we get taught that to actually lose, to, to in, engage emotionally or psychologically um, with the content of the work is you you run the risk you're going to lose your objectivity. That can't happen. Indeed, some might remember that one of the reasons women weren't allowed into the law was um, because they were too emotional. Mm. So of course, we understand, gee, I can't possibly get emotional about this because everyone will think I have lost my um, intellectual capacity, my objectivity, my ability to be fair-minded. So that's, that's the, first, the first problem. When I was um, in the wake of the, the um, extraordinary impact of um, Black Saturday, and, and we were, John, as you know, um, very focused on responding to those um, grieving families. With, within the constraints you could do within nothing the about. constraints. Yep. And we so there wasn't there wasn't really space to at that point to even think about um, what was happening to us. But it was some months later when we had finished the identification work and things had um, settled a bit that I started to notice um, I'll, I'll talk about myself. I started to notice really high levels of irritability, which are uncharacteristic for me. <laughs> um, and I realised I seemed to be somehow engaging in um, arguing with everybody. And, uh, and I was, yeah, I was starting to um, feel distracted. I was having some flashbacks of the scenes that I that I had seen and and the stories that I had heard. Were you crying spontaneously? Uh, I, uh, Another I, symptom of PTSD. Yeah, I don't I don't remember. I don't. I wasn't conscious of that. One of our fantastic counsellors, who was at coroner's, um, came to me 
um, round about this same time and said to me, Judge, are you familiar with um, vicarious trauma? And I said, oh, well, yeah, yeah, look, I've read a bit about it. And, of course, I stopped and did a double take and I said, uh, do you think that's what's happening? And she said, look, you know, I just think it might be helpful if um, you brought in some, some experts to maybe talk to the coroners. We had, I should say, we had done that for the staff immediately. I presume you sacked this councillor on the spot and told her her work was no longer required. Yeah. Um, we, look, we looked after the staff um, and on the basis of what I said before about us being yep. strong intellectuals, yep. we didn't we didn't turn that we didn't turn that low focus on ourselves. To cut a long story short, we ended up on a voluntary basis um, providing all of us with 12 weekly uh, every 12 weeks rotating through a debriefing session. We intentionally called it debriefing so that um, people didn't get, um, anxious about going into what they thought was some admission that they needed counselling. Oh, uh, it's interesting from the ABC point of view, as you mentioned, broadcasters. I mean, I was talking to people while they were dying and all of that, and it stayed with me a long time. I burst into tears spontaneously in the staff meeting one day, and I'm very happy to tell people I had to go off and I wanted to go off and I got counselling. And it was probably the best thing I could have done. Mm. But to admit that you needed it was the hardest part, mm. because you have this image, and you touched on it about you know, oh no, no, I, I'm not like those other people because I've been trained in this. Yeah, stuff. It's complete nonsense. So to come back to the important takeaway messages from that, um, what we what happened was our awareness was raised yep. by by hearing about the impacts of the potential for um, that. Uh, ongoing exposure to vicarious trauma, not to mention all the other stressors that we were working under at the time. So that awareness raising also helps one then understand, um, oh, so that's why I'm being so irritable and I'm engaging with, I'm, I'm having the fight part of the fight and flight response. Yep. Um, that's what I understood uh, of, of that then. So why then would you take on the most gruelling task imaginable of spending, how many years was it, talking to people about? Five years. Five years of mm. almost daily child sexual abuse, grooming, institutional abuse and all the rest of it. Was there any hesitation in your mind when you were asked to take on that Royal Commission? Um, so so why, why take it on? Um, in answer to that question, there's a few answers. Um, and, and the first one is, um, uh, let me quote Bob Dylan. Please. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, how many times can a person, so not man, but person, turn their head and pretend they just don't see? Yep. Um, I grew up with that notion, you know, if not, if not me and if not you, then who? Yep. Um, so when you get asked, uh, um, the the duty um, is one that uh, I, I took very seriously. Let me pose but, it another way. Yeah. If at the start you'd known it was going to go for five years and at such extraordinary um, cost, would you have still done it? Yes, without hesitation, I would have done it. That's why I'm proud to call you a friend. Oh, thank you, John. No, it's, mm -hmm. it is one of the most extraordinary thing. So take us through the therapeutic approach mm. that your Royal Commission adopted, which was almost the opposite of how Royal Commissions traditionally have run. Yes, and teaches us so much um, in the law, in the practice of the law, about the way in which a forum can be adapted to allow people to have their deeply personal accounts heard. So we, we did our work in three ways, um, private sessions, public hearings, and a, and a policy and research arm. Um, the, the public hearings were public. I think it, it, they were pretty clear the way in which we did our work in a fairly traditional format, although there was an enormous amount of support given to all people who came, uh, was offered, I should say, to all people who came before. Um, before the um, hearings. 
but it was the private sessions that um, were, I suppose, in a way, the most the most hidden for obvious reasons. So over that five years, we did. Um, there were six of us on that commission, and we um, met with over eight thousand people. So. Uh, we initially were going to sit in twos to give support and assistance to each other, but the sheer volume of numbers meant that we couldn't do that. So we conducted those private sessions in um, a supported and confidential environment. So we were in um, uh, hotel rooms, so not um, not your ordinary standard not a hotel courtroom environment. Um, not a courtroom environment. We were in hotels like like um, the commercial residential hotels without wanting to name any. One of the reasons we did that is because it was a neutral environment. Another reason was to minimise people's concerns that if they were seen coming in there, um, that they would have um, an alternative explanation to, to coming in there that was a perfectly plausible one because some people were so protective of their privacy for reasons we absolutely understood. And did that and make a difference to them? So you heard stories that otherwise had never been heard? Absolutely. We, we heard stories um, that people told us they had never spoken about before. I had the experience on a number of occasions, in particular of, um, this was a, a, a particular feature of men in about that um, 50 through to 70 age group. Indeed, mm -hmm. the oldest person that I saw was 93. And, uh, but that, that age group, um, it was not uncommon for them to say, I want to tell this story and I might have to use words that um, might upset you or, you you know, is it okay? Will you be all right? Um, and I, I, I want to go right into the detail because I, I need to say it. And we reassured them that that was exactly what we were there to listen to, their and, story in the way in which they wanted to say it. And were these people who had never spoken of never, these events before? Never spoken the words before. that the, To anyone? To anyone, yeah. And the chap, the 93-year-old chap who came in, and bear in mind we were, we, we were doing this right across the nation, yep. so we were travelling from one end of the nation to the other. The 93-year-old chap that came in said he had, he, um, he, he didn't want to go to his grave without having told anyone the story. And he, he was brought in by his 70-year-old daughter and he asked her to sit outside because he didn't want her to hear what he had to say. So back to the inside of the room. In the room was a commissioner. We tried to allow people a gender choice. Um, some, uh, and, and there were some people who didn't mind and there were others who who definitely mm -hmm. wanted a particular agenda. They had um, counselling support from our counselling team before they came in uh, and they did a debrief afterwards and um, and then they had a follow-up call at a time of their choosing. In strict legal terms, there are parties that were interested parties that were given leave to appear at the Royal Commission whose interests were being impacted by evidence you were taking without them being present. Mm. So how did you so <clears throat> so the first thing to say about that, um, John, and I'm going to forgive you for not being across every section of the Commonwealth Royal Commissions Act. Not um, today, I was. Yeah. I used to, yeah. um, is there was an amendment to the Act um, that uh, made absolutely clear that what we were hearing in those private sessions was not evidence. Um, it informed our investigations. It informed our policy and research. It informed us. And indeed, those stories with the consent of the people who came in have been written up by a team of writers that listened to those recordings. So it, it had an enormous impact, but it was not evidenced. Anything that was uh, of impact 
in a procedural fairness way upon people in public hearings had to be had to come before us in the public arena for us to place um, any weight upon it. But I, I want to just tell you one one um, one story out of the um, private sessions that speaks volumes about the importance of that truth telling forum. Um, a woman came in who had gone right through our criminal justice process. She had um, given her account to the police. She had, uh, um, the perpetrator had been charged. She'd given evidence at a, uh, she'd gone through the committal, the jury trial. He'd been convicted. He'd been sentenced to a considerable sentence. She'd written a victim impact statement. She'd been allowed to read it out in the court. She was um, quite positive about the way in which the police had responded to her and indeed the judge and the prosecutor. So she had no criticism of any part of that system. And when I said to her at the end, look, you don't have to answer this, but I wonder if you can just help me understand. You've been through every part of our criminal justice process and it would seem everything that it has to offer, including the opportunity through a victim impact statement to tell your story. And she said, yeah, but I haven't ever told my story. I haven't ever told my story mm. the way it happened to me. I always got told, no, you can't say that. No, you can't put that in your victim impact statement. Um, no, just answer this question. I know that's important to you, but that's not that 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 won't the judge won't allow that to happen or the or the defense counsel will object and she said this has been my opportunity to tell my story and i'm very grateful for it so people actually said thank you people um people said thank you not only did we get um tremendous feedback which was which was um very uh um very uplifting sounds like the right, no, wrong sustaining. word, but sustaining is the right word. Thank you. Um, but uh, during that time, I, it was not uncommon for people to tap me on the shoulder. Um, indeed, uh, um, speaking of Bob Dylan and Joan Baez, I, during that time, um, I was at a, I was actually at a Patti Smith concert, and um, standing in the queue waiting to go in, and. Um, someone tapped me on the shoulder and I looked around, it was a chap who said, you're that lady from the Royal Commission, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, can I give you a hug? And uh, I said, yes, you can. And, so, and that's exactly what happened. And it So was, Heng's yeah. question is, the one on everyone's mind, how do you carry on in spite of all that you've seen and heard? Well, you see, those those people, um, those people. That's why I. That's why I did that work, and to. You know, let me tell a story which I think illustrates it. Um, at at the end of a particular public hearing, and I, I won't name which one, um, uh, we uh, uh, we were there were three of us on the bench. We got up to leave and as we were leaving, someone yelled out from the body of the hearing room, thanks for coming to and named, named the particular city that we were in. And um, when I got back here, I, I maintained chambers at the family court throughout that time. When I got back, it had, it had been a, a hearing that had attracted um, some attention um, publicly. And a couple of the judges said to me, oh, you poor thing, you poor thing, you know, how are you? And I told them that story about the person who yelled out, thanks for coming. And I said, hands up the last person of you judges who had someone yell out, thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being. Doesn't here. happen often in the family no, court. Doesn't the, happen in the criminal court. No, they yell out um, lots of things. Um, but you know, John, just coming back to that um, that pattern of of the jurisdictions that I've been in, um, 
<clears throat> there is enormous, um, an enormous amount of um, positive feedback and, and I guess, um, confirmation of the value of the work that's being done um, through the people upon whom the impact is the greatest. And that is very sustaining. Well, we've barely scratched the surface. It's quite extraordinary the work that you've done over and over and over and over again. Uh, this law school can be proud to call you a graduate and Thank one you. of its alumni. We're very grateful to you for the work you've done, but also for being prepared to talk about it and to break a lot of the rules and to shape some of the future rules as a result of your preparedness, your bravery, your courage, Jenny. I'm just in awe. Ladies and gentlemen, that Thank brings you. to an end the fourth and final of our in conversations for Monash Uni Law School for 2021. <laughs> but wait, there's more. So apparently there's a plan to do some in 2022. I would be delighted to be able to continue with this process. And if we can find people who are anywhere near as compelling in the account they give of their career in the law as Jen Cope will be incredibly lucky to do so. So I look forward to seeing you next year. All the best for the festive season, which whatever it brings. Uh, I hope we win the ashes. I hope COVID stays away and uh, look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. Thanks. Jim.